And so he was faithful and gave me a good message for you guys this morning. I hope it blesses your heart, and I hope there's something that I can share with you today that's really going to help you out. We're going to talk today about how to survive the dry place. How many of you have ever been through a dry place? Amen. As long as I've walked through the, with the Lord, I have walked through several dry places in my life. And I've been successful at times, and I've been unsuccessful at other times. There are times when I've hung out there and what Pastor Tyner calls your pity potty. Have you ever heard him say pity party or sit on your pity pot? That's what he says. And there have been times when I have allowed myself to sit on my pity pot in my dry place and feel sorry for myself and stay there in the desert or in the valley or whatever in the world you want to call it. Sometimes it feels like the Arctic. That's as much of a desert as, as a sand desert. But allow myself to sit there and to to feel sorry for myself and it's done a lot of damage and so i want to help you in your dry season to be able to press on and to move on and to pursue god in the midst of that so that you can minimize the damage done to your life and to your spiritual walk with god so that you're not taking 50 steps backwards it's i heard an analogy the other day it's uh, sometimes our walk with god is like falling down an escalator right Trying to, you're trying to climb and you're, you're falling every few steps, but at least you're getting there. But we want to minimize that, that backward motion, that backward damage that can happen sometimes when we're in the dry season and learn how to pursue and to, to make our way through that. So what is a dry place? A desert is a barren area of landscape where little precipitation occurs and consequently living conditions are hostile for plant and animal life. The lack of vegetation exposes the unprotected surface of the ground to the processes of denudation, which are the processes that cause the wearing away of the Earth's surface, leading to a reduction in elevation. <laughs> it's good right there. There's a lot to be said in that right there. The exposure, the lack of protection, the hostile environment, the erosion of elevation. When we're in that dry place, the last thing we feel is elevated. The last thing we feel is protected. The last thing we feel is like we're thriving. We feel alone. We feel abandoned. We sing and we worship. We feel nothing. We read the Bible and sometimes we find ourselves just staring at the words. Seems like it's going in our eyeballs and then just bouncing around and going right back out. There's really nothing that we feel like we're absorbing. We pray and we feel like we're just talking to ourselves. The joy's not there. It seems like God's a thousand miles away. Anybody been there? Sure. Amen. But what you need to understand is the most powerful men and women of God have been in the desert place. <coughs> they've been in the desert place, they've experienced, they've been through the fire, and that's why they are so powerful. So you're in good company. Right. If you're there, if you've been there, you're in good company. And because God is so amazing and so wonderful that even that ugly, dark, time in your life, he's going to take that and turn that into one of your greatest victories. Amen. So we don't embrace it in the sense that we live in it and we sit in it and we feel sorry for ourselves in it, but we embrace it because we know that he's going to take it and make it a place of transformation for us. We know that when we come out of it, we're going to come out of it stronger. So we say, God, in this moment, I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on you. I'm going to survive this. You're going to bring me through this. You're going to teach me something in this. And we keep our head held high. But that's a hard thing to do. Sure. And that's a lot easier said than done. David knew exactly what the de desert place was. David was really good at articulating when he was in the midst of those times. And this is something that we need to learn how to do. This is Psalm 143. He said, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me. In your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you, for the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me to sit in darkness like those long dead, and therefore my spirit faints within me. My heart within me is appalled. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the works of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land, Selah. And the Psalms are full, full of words like this coming from the heart of David. He understood what it meant 
to be dry, to feel alone, to feel apart from God, and yet he still cried out. So what causes this desert place in our life? Does God abandon us? Does he turn his back on us and leave us? Does he punish us to teach us a lesson in his absence? Absolutely not. This dry place can come from several different places. And one big thing that I faced in my life is just going through physical disability in my life. Going through problems in my home life or whatever it might be, whether it's financial, whether it's disease, whatever it is, just going through difficulty in this physical realm. Because it fatigues you. It drags you down. It takes away your will. Your spirit man is still ready, but your flesh is weak. And the longer that flesh stays weak and pushed down, and we give in to that flesh and it stays weak and pushed down, the more the spirit man is rubbed down with it. We find ourselves giving in to the flesh because we're tired, we're mentally tired, we're emotionally tired. So we start to give it what it wants and we start to pacify it. And that's when we can find ourselves really quickly in a dry place and even worse in the midst of bitterness, blaming God for what's going on in our life, or feeling like he's doing this out of punishment for us, or, or he's lifted his hand of protection off of us, and our faith begins to diminish. We start to completely lose sight of the source. And what's ironic about that is that he's our only source of help in that moment. It's not him that's done this. In fact, he's the one with his hand outstretched, sure. wanting help. And we're the ones that are slowly becoming blinded to that fact. And slowly becoming bitter against him. Another big one is blatant sin. And I'm not talking about the little everyday things that we do that we don't think about. Sometimes I say something to somebody and I think, why did I say that? I didn't need to say that. That was gossip. You know what I mean? They didn't need to know that. Why did I say that? And the Holy Spirit convicts me. Or I, I don't want to do something. So instead of just saying, I don't want to do that. I say, oh, I got this or that, which is true, but it's not really the truth. Do you see what I'm saying? Every day we do things that aren't quite right. Sometimes it's it's certain sins, other sins, but I'm talking about walking in blatant sin. These things that God has told you clearly do not do, and we still, oh, no, I'm going to go my own way, man. See you later. I'm going to do this over here. I'm talking about blatant sin. Blatant sin will take you into a desert place real quick because sin separates us from God. Our God is a holy God. He's a righteous God. He has no place with that mess. And he's told you not to touch it. And you're going you're gonna to pick that thing up and keep it between the two of you. It's like knowing that the person you love the most hates spiders. So I'm going to carry around this big tarantula on my hand and expect them to want to be around me. You know what I'm saying? The sin separates us from him. We turn our back from his perfect will, his beautiful way. And we say, no, I'm going to go my own way and do my own thing. That's my choice. And so that will bring you into a desert place really, really, really quick. Running from your calling or being afraid of where God's wanting to take you to will take you into a desert place. you got something you're holding on to and you know, man, I'm getting close to him. I can feel him. He's trying to tell me to put that down. Yeah. And I can't do it yet. I can't put that down. Whatever it is, that's my safety blanket. I can't let go of that relationship. I, I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready to, to move out of living with my boyfriend or girlfriend. I'm not ready to, I, I can't. And so we run because we know he's going to ask us to do something that our flesh wants to keep on doing. Or we know he's calling us to something that's outside of our comfort zone. Yeah. It's going to take some sacrifice. We're not ready for it. We don't want to do it. And so we run away instead of just being open and honest before the Lord and confessing and saying, God, Right now, I just confess to you, I feel like in myself, I can't do this. I need your help. You know, if you would just open up your mouth and be real and say that, that that's the invitation he's waiting on to come and bring deliverance to you. Right, right. To take the taste of whatever that is out of your mouth or to take the desire for whatever that thing is away from you. He's waiting on you to just be honest instead of turning your back and running every time. He just wants you to say, I can't do it on my own. I need your help. But instead, we turn and we run. We run like Moses ran from his calling. Found himself out in the desert and hurting sheep. 
You better watch out. You might turn around one day and there's going to be a burning bush there talking to you. Because you can only run so far. But we find ourselves out wandering around aimlessly and thinking that he's abandoned us when it's us that have stopped pursuing him. It's us that have become lazy. It's us that have decided to fulfill whatever will of the flesh is there. And because of that, we're not alone. And we're not isolated. So what happens to us in that dry place? We become spiritually weak because we're not coming in contact with the power that we were coming in contact with before. We're not feeling that anointing anymore. He is your source, your source of everything. You have to remember that. You can't for a moment forget that. If you do, you're going to find yourself right back in the same place that you've always been. And how's that working out for you? How far have you gotten in life without him? Nowhere. Nowhere. You have to remember that he's the source. So we find ourselves spiritually weak, which not only affects us, but it affects all of the other people around us that we were supposed to encounter, the people that we were supposed to witness to, right. the people that we were supposed to affect. And it's like, it's, it just goes on and on and on, the reaction to that, because then that person could have changed somebody else's life. That person could have affected their children, and their children would come to know the Lord. So when you're spiritually weak, that's not just your problem. That affects everybody else around you. Not only does it make you in, unable to properly witness and minister and fulfill your calling, but you also find yourself acting out in other ways. The fruits of the Spirit are not something that come natural for us as people generally. Okay? Our, our fleshly nature is selfish. And it's rude. And so we start to act out in ways that we shouldn't, and that definitely affects our family and those around us, especially our children. We're acting out anger. We find ourselves snapping at them, yelling at them. Our contentment is gone. Our peace is gone. That joy that used to fill the house is gone. And so we see just a ripple effect that comes off of this whenever we allow ourselves to stay in this ugly place. We begin to question our faith because the presence of God is not there to confirm that he's real. We're human. And you have to admit that that happens. Now, the longer you've been in him, and the more that you know that you know that you know that he's real, the harder it is for this to happen, okay? Let me tell you. But it can happen even to the best of us. When you've been away from him long enough, and you haven't felt the power of God for long enough, the enemy can come, try to come in and tell you, what was this all about anyways? Did you ever really feel him? Is this real? What is this all for? What do you get up and go to church for? What do you do all this for? Why do you teach these kids every Sunday? Why do you, why do you, why do you, why do you? It feels, fills your mind with questions and causes you to question your very faith and your belief in God. We become ashamed and isolated because we're not on fire like the other ones around us. So we think, what's wrong with me? Everybody else wants to come down around front and worship. And I see Martha holler and run around the church because the power of God hits her so strong. And look at me, I don't even want to come in. I don't even want to get up in the morning and put my clothes on. What's wrong with me? And that comparison causes us to become even more isolated and ashamed. Yeah. And we feel like I'm, I'm just a bad person. That must be the enemy can just come in and just start lying to us. I must just be a bad, selfish person. I'm not like everybody else. And what he's doing when he does that is he is just continuing to get you more and more isolated from your church family. Right. Because he knows it takes sometimes just one word of encouragement, a pat on the back by somebody that loves you and right. says it's going to be okay. He did it for me. He can do it for you. Right. Like Tommy did when he stood up here earlier. Just, just one word to the congregation or a word of uh, encouragement from a friend. He wants to keep you at home. He wants to keep you isolated. Right. The daily operations of our lives and re relationships are affected because we're not hearing the voice of the Lord like we should we That discernment is not there like it should be. The Holy Spirit is not in operation with us like it should be. So we begin to make wrong choices and decisions. And sometimes those wrong choices and decisions can affect us for a long time. We are dependent upon Him, upon this Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us into all truth. And so we find ourselves acting out in ways that we would never act. And deciding to go ways that we would never go. We don't want to pray. We don't want to worship. We don't want to study. We don't want to pursue Him because it's too hard. 
And I have talked to people that are having problems in their marriage before, and I'll say, well, why don't you guys go to counseling? And you can see it on their face. It's too hard. That time has passed. I'm done with that. You will come to a place where you will become so bitter that it is too hard, too hard to crack open the Word of God, too hard to turn on a song and listen to it, too hard to walk into the house of God because you are so broken and bitter and far away at that point. One thing that happens with me, and I don't understand it at all because I live for worship. That's where I thrive. In this moment up here, I am never closer to the Lord than when I stand up here and I worship the Lord and the power of God falls. I love that. I know what that can do. It's transformative. It's amazing. And for some reason, well, I, I guess it's not a mystery when I say it like this. Obviously, that's what Satan would choose. The, the moment that I become dry in my spirit, you would think the first thing that I would run to is worship music and turn that on. That's the first thing that I reject. I do not for a second want to hear anything, especially from Bethel or anything that really usually touches my heart. I don't want to hear it because I don't want to feel. I don't want to feel in that moment. I don't want to cry. I, I don't want it. My flesh completely rejects it. And so I think I've said this before, but I've learned then. When that happens, I know I'm in serious trouble, and that's a moment that I need to turn it on and listen to it all day, as long as it takes. I need to cry as much as I need to cry. And because we have to recognize the work of the flesh. We have to recognize what the flesh man is trying to do, and it's always trying to get its way. You know, we read those scriptures about the sin nature stopping. You'll no longer want to sin once you're in Christ. And we're like, how can that be? It's the spirit man. It's the spirit man that's transformed and says, I no longer want to do those things. I love him. I look like him now. I bear his name. I want to be like him, right? It's the flesh that continues to say, I want this. I want that. I want this. I want that. The way that those scales tip and turn is when we push the flesh down and we tell it, you're not going to get what you want. And that's done by fasting and that's done by sacrificing over time and proving to your flesh that it's going to take second place. Spirit man is first. This is who I am. Like we just say, this, you are my reality. Your, your thoughts define me. You're inside me. You're my reality. We have to make the spirit man our reality. The reality of this, though, is that some people don't survive the dry places. Some people never make it out of it. You watch... Even brand new Christians sometimes so on fire for the Lord, just giving their heart to Him, just encountered this beautiful, loving God. Sure. They go through their first dry season and you never see Him walk in the door again. So that's the reality. That's how serious that these dry places can be. You don't want to take them lightly. When you find yourself there and you come to the reality that you're there, that's the moment you start fighting back. You don't wait. You don't get content in it. That's the moment you start fighting back. And if you're too weak to fight, you get somebody else to help you fight. Yeah, you call on God to fight for you. Right. But that's the moment that you speak up, the moment that you realize that. So how do we survive the dry place? David, David had this key, this key of worship. David knew how to cry out to the Lord. He knew how to express himself to God. He knew how to open himself up to God. And he was imperfect, just like us. But he had this amazing ability to do it. This is a good example of how to survive the dry place. Listen to this. This is Psalm 63. A Psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld the power of your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed I remember you, I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Those who want to kill me 
will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glorify him, while the mouths of the liars will be silenced. Yeah. That's how you survive a dry place. Right. You start to speak that those things that aren't, you speak as though they were. You say, I remember you. I remember all the things that you've done for me. You start to testify to yourself. You start to testify to others. That's what gets me through my dry place. Is when I stop and I think, I remember, he healed my baby. He healed my body. I've heard people speak words of prophecy that no man can know. I felt the power of God move over me. No man could have had moved over me that way. I felt that. That was the power of God. I remind myself of who he is and what he's done. And I encourage myself in that. You need to bank those things away in your heart and in your memory. Those things that you've seen that are supernatural, those times when you've heard him speak, those times when you've watched him move, the testimonies that you've heard, bank those away, seal those in your heart because that's what's going to get you through the hard times. That's what's going to help you remember who he is. And like David, you can say, this is what's happening, but you will do this. And I see that mountain, but it will be cast into the sea. Because this is who you are. You remind yourself of who he is, the nature of a good, good father. That's one way that you survive the dry place. Seek him even when you don't feel him. Even when you don't feel like it. And when you search after him, don't search after him like you lost a dollar bill. Seek after him like you just dropped a million dollars and you don't know where it is. You understand? You would not eat. You would kill yourself trying to find a million dollars if you dropped a million dollar check. Right? You would kill yourself to find that million dollars. That's the way you need to seek after him. In the valley, in the dark place, in the dry place. You need to pursue him. Zion used the word pursue a thousand times when he was with us this weekend. And this week, it must be something really in their vernacular down there at Bible College. And after a while, Frank said, did you pursue it? But did you pursue it? <laughs> and we just kind of laughed. And I said, no, Bobby, that is a good word. Absolutely. Yeah. Pursue. Right. That needs to be in your mind. That's part of our walk with God. Constant pursuit of Him. Constantly pressing forward, seeking Him to know Him. James 4 and 8 says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. That's a promise in the Word of God. Then he also says this, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Why does he say that? Because he knows that that's something that's going to block that drawing together, right? Get it out of the way. Matthew 5 and 6 says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled, they shall be filled. These are promises in the Bible. In the desert sometimes, there are underground sources of water. Sometimes there are underground sources that roots can tap into. There may be underground sources of water in the form of springs and seepages from aquifers. Where these are found, even an oasis can occur and spring up from the ground. But these are places you have to seek out. Right. Sometimes you're not going to be able to just hop out of this desert place in a moment. Sometimes you're going to have to grasp on to the things that he gives you as they come. So when you're seeking him, and it gives you that little nugget out of the Word of God. Or you turn on the radio and there's finally something that clicks in your heart. Or you come in here for worship and there's finally a service where you feel Him. Hold on to that. Store that. Let it sustain you until this storm is over. Remember it. Write it down. Recite it. Keep it with you because there's some things that are going to be hidden that you're going to have to seek after that He's given you as provision to help you through this time. In the desert plains and animals living there need special adaptations to survive in the harsh environment. Some annual plants germinate, bloom, and die in the course of a few weeks after a rainfall because they're not established. Right. Their roots are shallow. While other long-lived plants survive for years and have deep root systems able to tap into underground moisture, those are the ones that are established. So in your high times, when you're up on the mountain, when you're running full force, don't forget, don't forget to store up. You understand what I'm saying? 
to store back for the hard times, to plant the word of God in your heart. The Bible talks about that, to meditate upon it. Bank those things that you know are going to help you. Keep resources there in the house that you know are going to help you through the hard times. Write down scriptures that you know are going to help you during the hard moments. Those songs that you keep with you that you know get you through the bad times. Bank those things and keep them. You have got to learn how to endure. And when you do, there's something so powerful in that. In a saint that's been through hard trials and fires time after time again, and yet they come out the other side. There's a If you see a marriage that's like that, where they have really been through the ringer, and they come out the other side and they stay together, the love that's there between them, it's such a powerful thing. There's nothing that can separate them. And it's the same way with your walk with God. The more that you get deeply rooted and grounded with Him, and you can say, it is well with my soul no matter what I go through, no matter what I face, it is well with me. The more that you do that, the more that you become entrenched in Him, the more you're going to be able to survive these moments when you do go through the hard times. And you're going to have strength and power that other people won't know. People say all the time, I, I want their anointing. I want to be like that person. I want to preach like this person. And they say, but you don't want to go through what I went through to get it. And that's the truth. The people who have great power in the kingdom of God are the people who have endured, who have stored up, the people who understand how to run this race with endurance. And we have to learn how to do that. Put away shame and reach out to a friend. That's a big one. Because again, Satan would like for us to be isolated. Find you someone that you can go to and tell them, I'm going through a really hard time right now. I need you. I need your prayers. This is what I'm facing. I'm going through a dry time, and I need somebody to join with me. <coughs> that way they can call you. They can look up, uh, check in on you. They can check in on you at service time. They can help come alongside you and pray for you. Remember the work of the cross and the gospel. That's another big one. When Clay was preaching Sunday, he had so much good stuff to say. I was like, holy cow, this is awesome. He had all those motivational videos, and some of that was, I mean, just really powerful stuff. But what hit me was, he showed that scene of the Passion of the Cross, or uh, the Passion of the Christ where Jesus was carrying the cross. And I thought, out of everything that he showed, out of everything that he said, those few moments in that clip hit me the hardest out of anything. There's nothing that can trump that. There's nothing that will ever, ever trump that. Right. That act of love, the work of the cross, the moment that Jesus said, I'll take their sins upon me. Yes. And not only did he die for all of humanity, I want you to understand what I'm saying right now. He died individually for you and for you and for you and for you. Because he was God in that moment, you individually were on his mind. He died for you, specifically. And so when I think about that and I think about the simple purity of the gospel, in just a moment that can break my walls down. It affects me so deeply every time I sit over there and I just bawl and cry. I can't, I can't comprehend that act of love, that act of sacrifice. And so just stopping to take a moment to remind yourself of the day that he saved your soul. The day that he called you out of your mess. Yes. And remind yourself of, of all the love that he's given you and the forgiveness that he's given you. Can help break away that stony heart. Every once in a while... There's a flash flood that happens too. And although rain seldom occurs in the desert, there are occasional downpours that can result in flash floods. Rain falling on hot rocks can cause them to shatter. Embrace that. You want that. I promise you that there will come a time when that dry place will be done and over with. When he is going to saturate the ground that you're on and you're going to dance on barren land. I promise you that that moment will come when that trial will be over. If you pursue him, if you don't give up and you don't give in. And when that flash flood happens, you're sitting in the middle of service and that flash flood happens, allow that to come and break up that stony heart. I don't care if you have to act a fool and ball and snot pour out of your nose. That's what you need to do. Let him come in. Let him fix those places now that are, that are hurt and tired and broken from going through this long dry spell. Let him saturate your heart and your life again. 
that he will be full. I mean, come up here and drink as much as you can drink out of that well. I mean, in that moment, when you finally feel that breakthrough after all this time, interrupt the service. I don't care. Run down to the front. Drink it in and embrace right. it. Yes. And let God touch every place that needs to be touched yes. in here. Amen? Yes. Amen. It's super important. This time in your life, when you're going through a dry season, is the time that you get to prove to Him the most your love and your faithfulness. When you're married to somebody and they've been treating you like dirt and you still serve them, run them a hot bath, bring them some breakfast, whatever it might be, in that moment what you're doing is you're proving to them in a big way your love and your faithfulness. And when we're far away from the Lord, and He knows, because He knows that he, he knows everything. And he knows that you've not felt His embrace for a long time. And He knows you've been going through a hard time. And He knows that life has been hard and everything is really stoked. And yet you put on your clothes and you come in to service. And you raise your hands and you worship Him. And you proclaim His goodness. You tell somebody out in the grocery store how wonderful He is, how awesome He is. All of these things are such a huge way that you can prove your love and faithfulness to Him. Can you imagine how it touches the heart of God? Sure. To see that, to know that? Right. That right now, without me giving anything, look how much they're giving back. Look how much they love me, how, how willing they are to serve me. And do you think, you think then that He will withhold blessing from you? No. He loves you. And I promise you, there will be a time when you walk up out of this place. Today, if you're in a dry season, He doesn't want you to stay there long. That's not His purpose. That's not His plan for your life. There is something. There is something, I promise you, that you will find in the midst of that. Something He wants to teach you. Something you're going to hear. Something that you're going to come out of this with. And it's going to be something impactful that's going to change your life. Don't let this be in vain. Like I said, embrace it. Find out what it is that God's trying to show you in this moment. Listen and hear. Because even though He's not the one who's caused it, He uses all things for His good. Yes. Right? Think about what you could have done to cause this dry season. Am I walking in blatant sin? Have I just become so tired and fatigued that I'm becoming bitter against Him that I'm pushing away from Him? Whatever it is, dig into it. Dig around it. Find out what it is. Don't just ignore it. Don't just say, I'm going through a rough time and I don't have enough energy to think about it. No. Dig into it. Find out what it is and get it right with the Lord. Lay it out before Him. If you can't figure it out, if you don't know why you're far apart from Him, if you don't know why you're not feeling the anointing, come to Him and ask Him. Open up your mouth and talk to Him. Say, God, why? Why are you far from me right now? Reveal to me what it is. Because I long for you. Like David. Cry out to him, I long for you in a dry and desert place. Yes. I want to be connected to you again. If you've not been there, then you don't understand the pain that comes when you are separated from the Father. Jesus felt that more than anybody else the moment he died on the cross and the Father had to turn his back away from him in judgment so that sin could die on that cross. But that breaking away, that tearing away is painful and it will become more and more and more painful as you go. So it's not time to lay down and die. I taught a message to Kickstart last week about the four lepers that sat at the gate. And they finally said, are we just going to sit here until we die? What are we going to do? There's a famine in the city. They don't want us anyways. If we go in there, they're probably going to kill us. Right? If we sit here, we're going to die. The only thing we have left to do is surrender ourselves to our enemies. We'll go beg for their uh, not forgiveness, but anyways, back right there, whatever word my love, mercy. So they go down to the camp and they find that God has drove the enemy out supernaturally by making them think that they hear a big army coming after them. So they took off and left all their provisions. The lepers go down there and they eat and they gain provisions. God saves their life. But they had to come to a, a reality, a moment where they said, are we just going to sit here till we die? This is crazy. And that's the moment that some of you need to have today. If you've been in a dry place for a long time, you need to say to yourself, am I just going to sit in this until I'm spiritually dead? Until I absolutely have nothing left? 
Till every last ember is gone inside of me. That's insanity. Remind yourself of who he is. Remind yourself of the power that you felt, the miracles that you've seen. And take those steps for him. Whatever it takes, whatever you have to lay down, it's worth it. You will never in your life have anything more valuable than this. This salvation, this deliverance, this power, this anointing, this love. And it's been free to you. Freely given to you, poured out upon you. When you didn't deserve it, he gave it to you. Why would you turn your back on it and reject it? Why would you let it wane? Why would you let it fizzle out? Why would you let the enemy douse the fire that you have? You can do something about it. Even in your weakest moment, you can cry out. You don't have to die in that place. Amen? Would you all stand to your feet this morning?